and tax planning. So today we are joined by Baird's tax strategists, Kelsey Clare and Eric Wickstrom. As you know, year end is typically a time to think about tax and other planning strategies, but with Congress poised to enact a variety of changes, the window for some of these strategies may be sooner than you've expected. So Kelsey and Eric are gonna discuss these potential changes and how it may impact you. For those of you not familiar with Kelsey, she is a tax strategist who joined Baird in 2020. Kelsey graduated from the University of South Carolina with both a bachelor's and master's degree in accountancy and with focus in taxation. Kelsey is a certified public accountant with the North Carolina State Board of Certified Public Accountant Examiners, as well as the Virginia Board of Accountancy. And for those of you who are not familiar with Eric, Eric joined Baird in 2021 and graduated from the University of Washington with a bachelor's of arts degree in business administration and also holds a master's of science in taxation from Golden Gate University in San Francisco, California. He holds a CPA and CFP designations as well as life insurance and disability license in the state of Washington. So before I turn the call over to them, I have a few housekeeping items that I'd like to highlight. For optimal viewing, we suggest that you set your setting to the side-by-side -side view via the circle in the upper right-hand corner of your screen. All participants are in a listen-only mode, but we would love to hear from you. So we will host a Q&A session at the end of the call to address as many questions as we possibly can. You can submit a question by clicking on the Q&A icon on the bottom right-hand side of your screen, but please be sure that you address your questions to all panelists. Um, this presentation is being recorded and will be available along with the slide deck about a week following today's presentation through your Baird Financial Advisor. So reach out to them um, if you want the presentation or the recording. But thank you, Eric and Kelsey, for joining us today. Kelsey, I'm now going to turn the call over to you. The floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Justine. All right. So obviously the one point, you know, we've seen the 1.2 trillion physical infrastructure bill. Um, called the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act that was signed by Biden this past Monday. Uh, it did include spending budgets for specific programs such as bridge, rehabil re bridge rehabilitation, climate change, and transportation safety, um, but the legislation didn't include any of those tax increases, um, you know, that we've been, we've been hearing so much about. So that brings us to the proposed tax bill called the Build Back Better Act. Um, it's also known as the House Infrastructure Bill. So we've we've seen various versions of this since it was originally introduced um, over the past, I guess it's been about a couple months now. So um, we're going to cover what is and isn't included in the latest version of that bill. I'm then going to touch on the um, 2021 recovery rebate credit, which you probably remember as the economic stimulus payment. Um, and then I'll pass it on to Eric to, to discuss some general year end tax planning strategies and what to consider prior to year end. So the tax increase proposal is called the Build Back Better Act. Uh, we saw this first introduced on September 14th, and it included a lot of the provisions that Biden focused on during his pre presidential campaign. Um, October 28th, um, a slimmed down version came down, came, was released on that proposal and it removed a lot of those core tax increases that, that we were expecting to see. The November 3rd version is the latest version that we have um, that was released and it, it reintroduced some of those retirement provisions that we saw removed in the October 28th version. November 4th, um, an amendment came out to, to that proposal, which um, was related to the SALT provision, which is the state and local tax provision. Um, so we'll talk about that, that more here shortly. The House was hoping to vote on this sometime this week, um, but keep in mind that if it does, it still might undergo some changes that, um, in the Senate, so which would require to go back to the House. So it, it might be a while before we see something actually passed here. All right, what is not included? So, um, you know, these are a lot of the big items, like I mentioned, that we really thought were going to be included in this bill. So not in this proposal, and, and it definitely could be reintroduced as negotiations continue. Um, but the increase in the top ordinary and long-term capital gains rates was not in this recent proposal. So that was the 
increase from the 37 to 39.6% tax rate, as well as the increase from the 20% to the 25% capital gains rate. Neither of those were included. The cap on pass-through business deduction, also known as the 199A deduction, there was basically a limit on how much you could claim as a deduction um, in, in one of the proposal versions that has since been removed. Additional restriction on investments in IRAs. Um, this was, this was um, restriction on, in, on investments that were limited to accredited investors. Basically, those were no longer allowed to be held in an IRA and you had a two year grace period to get out of those investments. That is not included in this recent uh, proposal. The accelerated reduction in the estate gift and GST tax exemption. You know, we've, we've heard a lot of noise about that um, dropping from the, the current 11.7 to five adjusted for inflation. Um, that is no longer included in the bill, but keep in mind that the uh, Tax Cuts and Jobs Act, which is what initially increased that amount, um, is scheduled to expire at the end of 2025. So we are still scheduled to go back to that 5 million adjusted for inflation starting in 2026. So we still wanna keep that um, estate planning ideas in mind. Changes to the federal estate tax rate. Um, we, we were looking at a, a graduated system as well as a higher rate overall in, in some of the proposals. This has been removed. Changes to the step up in basis at death. Um, which is a big one, um, you know, getting the step up to the fair market value, which really helps um, your beneficiaries from having to realize significant gains. That was not included in the latest proposal either. Same with the defective grantor trust inclusion in the state, as well as the elimination of valuation discounting for specific assets. So um, while those were all in previous versions, they are not in the latest, they could still be reintroduced. Um, but that's, we're not going to focus on those today. We're going to focus on, you know, what, what is in the latest version. All right. So that brings me to, uh, discussing what is actually included in this November 3rd version. So tax surcharge, um, we're going to go into detail on all this, um, in the next few slides, but there is a tax surcharge, in, surcharge included in this version, the 3.8% net investment income tax on ordinary business income. Um, an increased state and local tax deduction. Um, so that um, that's referring to the $10,000 cap that's currently in place for itemizers, people that itemize their deductions. Uh, new restrictions on Roth conversions, restrictions on IRA contributions, as well as expanded RMDs or required minimum distributions from retirement plans. So we'll jump into the tax surcharge. So. This is an additional 5% surcharge on any modified adjusted gross income exceeding these threshold amounts. So for single married filing jointly, that's 10 million. For married filing separately, that's cut in half to five. And for trust in states, that's 200,000. So, um, you know, a lot of people, this, this probably won't impact, but for those that are uh, seeing income at this level, um, that's definitely, you know, a, a big tax hike there. They also have an additional 3% surcharge on modified adjusted gross income exceeding these threshold amounts below. So um, for a single or married couple that has over 25 million in modified adjusted gross income, they're looking at a total 8% surcharge on that income above that 25 million. Now it, all, it applies to all forms of income. So um, even you know, certain income that gets preferential tax rates, such as qualified dividends, capital gains, those still would be subject to the surcharge. surcharge. Um, it cannot be avoided with deductions such as charitable contributions. So it is modified adjusted gross income, which is um, can, does not factor in any below the line deductions, itemized deduction, the standard deduction, qualified business income deduction, none of that would be included. Um, and then this would be effective starting next year. So uh, January 1st of 2022. All right, additional taxes on business owners. So uh, this would apply a 3.8% net investment income tax to pass through business income. 
Now it would only apply on business income not already subject to employment taxes, um, which is typically K-1 income. And, and they're doing this mostly to kind of close up a loophole that's currently in place. If you have an S Corp, you can pay yourself a reasonable salary. That salary is subject to payroll taxes, but any additional income that's not paid out in the form of a salary and it's just paid to you in form of distributions, that is just business income and it's not subject to these payroll taxes. So this would essentially close that loophole. Now, it doesn't apply to everyone. Um, your modified adjusted gross income would have to be exceeding these amounts here. It's 500,000 for a joint filer. Um, so if you still fell below, you wouldn't be subject to that. But if you were exceeding these amounts, then you'd be subject to this 3.8%. This also is effective um, next year, so January 1st of 2022. The state and local tax deduction, also known as the SALT deduction. So right now we have a $10,000 per married couple, as well as single filer um, deduction available on your tax return. This is an itemized deduction. So you do have to itemize your deduction to claim this, this SALT deduction. But um, this provision would actually increase that amount from the 10,000 to 80,000. In the November 3rd version, that amount was a little lower from 80. It was about 73,000. That provision, the, the update on November 4th, just um, increased that amount to 80,000. It'd be five from five to 40,000 for um, merit, those filing separately, estates and trusts. And it would be effective for 2021 through 2030. So we're, we're looking at a retroactive enactment here. So it would apply to the current year as well. Like I said, it only applies if you itemize deductions. Um, and keep in mind that even if this proposal doesn't go through, the $10,000 SALT cap that was enacted as part of the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act back in 2017, um, that's set to expire at the end of 2025. So that cap, 10,000 cap is already set to, to be eliminated um, for the 2026 tax year. This would essentially accelerate it to 2021 and put a new cap of 80,000. All right, restrictions on Roth conversions. I think this has been a, a big topic and um, you know, have, has caused a lot of people to really consider Roth conversions in the current year. So one of the new uh, provisions in this, in this bill is a prov prohibits the conversion of any after-tax money in a retirement plan to a Roth IRA, Roth IRA. So this means that there's not gonna be any more of that backdoor Roth conversion methodology. So you can't make after-tax non-deductible contributions to a traditional IRA and then convert those to an, a Roth IRA. Um, same thing with the mega backdoor Roth conversion, which some employers offer. Um, you're not gonna be able to convert those dollars anymore, allowing the future growth to be tax-free. Um, they, they would have to stay in the pre-tax bucket and earnings would be growing on a tax deferred basis. This um, would be effective January 1st of 2022. Keep in mind that you can still convert pre-tax assets. So um, if you have a pre-tax 401k uh, or pre-tax assets in a traditional IRA, you can still convert those. It's just any after-tax or, or basis is what we call it. Um, in those accounts that cannot be converted. Um, another restriction on Roth conversions is beginning in 2032, there will be no Roth conversions allowed entirely for joint filers with taxable income over 450 or 400 for single filers. Um, so, you know, the IRS's or the House would be giving you, you know, about 11 years to get those Roth conversions completed before this would take effect. And, you know, we, we would expect that to be because they want you to go ahead and um, pick up that income sooner rather than later, pay the taxes um, in the next 10 years or so. This is based on taxable income. So it can be avoided with certain deductions like charitable contributions, mortgage interest, all that. Um, so as long as you keep your taxable income below these thresholds, you wouldn't be subject to this. 
restrictions on IRA contributions. So this provision would prohibit IRA contributions if the contributions would cause the value of all your retirement accounts to exceed or further exceed $10 million. Now this would only apply to you if your modified AGI adjusted gross income exceeds these thresholds. So 400,000 for a single or a married couple filing separately, 425 for head of household and 450 for a married couple. Um, the employer plan, so 401k, 403b, that would be included in that $10 million balance. And it applies to traditional and Roth accounts. So um, it, it's not restricted to traditional balances. You have to accumulate all of your balances to determine if you fall at that $10 million threshold. This wouldn't be effective, though, until um, 2029 tax year. So you have some time to to make some contributions or, or get that balance down um, to a level below that 10 million number. All right, expanded requirement required minimum distributions. This basically is requiring you to take an additional distribution from your um, IRA balance or employer plan if that balance exceeds $10 million. And this is in addition to your, you know, your regular required minimum distributions that you're already subject to. So we'll look at the first, look at the first um, line first. So if your MAGI modified adjusted gross income exceeds these thresholds and the prior year end retirement account balances exceed $10 million, then you must with, withdraw 50% of the balance that exceeds $10 million reduced by the second provision. So that's step one. Step two, same thresholds, MAGI thresholds. If the, the balance of your prior year-end retirement accounts exceed 20 million and they include Roth accounts, then you have to essentially take those distributions from those Roth accounts first, or at least until you get to a $20 million balance. Once you've reduced it to the 20 million, then any additional distributions you have to take under the first line can be taken from whichever account you would like, uh, traditional pre-tax versus Roth. Uh, keep in mind, it does apply to all forms of um, IRA and employer plans, including inherited accounts. So while a lot of times inherited accounts aren't included in aggregation rules, this, this one is. Um, it does not apply to defined benefit plans, though. It does apply regardless of age. So um, there is an, an early withdrawal penalty that's waived. Um, should you be required to withdraw some of this and, and not be 59 and a half? Um, like I said, it applies in addition to the normal RMD. But this doesn't take effect until 2029. So um, again, you have some time to bring those balances down in the next 10 years um, or nine years. Um, you also you know, can avoid this just by keeping your modified adjusted gross income below these levels. So that covers all kind of you know, the big provisions that we've seen in this latest proposal. It's what we feel is gonna impact most of our clients here at Baird. Um, I did also wanna to touch on one other provision that was actually already passed. Um, there was a version passed in the CARES Act as well as the American Rescue Plan Act, and this was the economic stimulus payment. Um, it's essentially, it's, it's called a recovery rebate credit on your tax return, but this was a $1,400 stimulus payment per qualifying individuals, including adult dependents, and it had these phase outs below. Now these were paid in advance and it was, it was based on your 2020 tax return or 2019 return if you hadn't filed your 20 return yet. And these payments were, were paid in advance. Um, so it really was considered an advance payment of this 2021 tax credit. Now, when you, when you file your 2021 tax return come April or if you're extending later on in the year, that credit is gonna be recalculated on your 2021 tax return. If the calculated amount exceeds what you've received in advance, you can claim that difference 
as a recovery rebate credit. Now, if the calculated amount turns out to be less than the advance payment, so basically you received more than you were entitled to, uh, maybe because your, your income ended up going up in 2021, there was there is a no clawback provision. So basically you don't have to pay that back. Um, very nice of them to do. Um, you know, I think they did it mostly to, you know, try to help people when, you know, the pandemic was really in, in the worst of it. Um, but if, if it is the credit amount is less than what you've received, you don't have to pay that back. Um, so I just wanted to highlight that and make sure you guys were aware of that as you start filing a return returns next year, make sure you're providing your CPA with that information, what you've received to date, so that that information can be properly reported on your return. And with that, um, that's all I had on, on this side. I'm gonna pass it over to Eric Wickstrom. He's gonna talk more on the general year-end tax planning strategies, as well as some considerations um, to take into account as we do approach year-end. Well, thank you, Kelsey, uh, and happy birthday. Um, hello, everyone. My name is Eric Wickstrom, and I'm going to be talking to you about some general uh, year-end tax planning strategies. But before I do, I want to really just take a minute here and cement uh, an idea and concept before we go too far down the road, because this comes up a lot. So for individuals, we all just have two common individual income type items. Uh, we have ordinary income items on the left. Uh, and those things include uh, wages, dividends, IRA distributions, Roth conversions. And then we have capital gain items. So if you sell a position in your board portfolio, uh, that's a capital asset, which gets capital gain treatment. Now, if you hold the asset less than a year, that's gonna be a short-term capital gain or loss. And if you hold it for more than a year, you get preferred long-term capital gain treatment. So again, we only have to focus on what are ordinary income items and what are capital gain items. Now, with that being said, we have ordinary income brackets on the left and capital gain brackets. So uh, real quickly, with ordinary income, you ratchet up those brackets just like you would walking up a set of stairs. So if you had $100,000 of ordinary income, the first 19,000 of it, married, filing, joint, single people have their own brackets, head of household have their own brackets. But for $100,000, the first 19, nine would be taxed at 10, the next 60,000 is taxed at 12, and then the next increment is ta taxed at 22. So a lot of people ask, well, if I make 100,000, isn't that all taxed at 22? Well, it's not. Some's at 10, some's at 12, some's at 22, okay? Capital gains are similar but different in that capital gains don't start getting taxed until your ordinary income stops. So if you had $100,000 of ordinary income and $20,000 of capital gain, again, two different types of income, the, uh, on the right, the capital gain bracket, your ordinary income of 100,000 would put you in that 15%, and that's where your capital gains start being taxed at 15%. So again, ordinary income brackets, capital gain brackets, uh, capital gains less than a year are taxed at ordinary rates, capital gains more than a year are taxed at long-term capital gain brackets. And what we're gonna take a look at in just a minute is a, tra a traditional IRA to Roth conversion, and that gets taxed at ordinary income rates. So that's why we're walking through to make sure everybody understands when we talk about Roth conversions, they're great things. It's great to have a Roth IRA, but to get from a traditional IRA to a Roth IRA, you have to pay tax on the dollar amount at ordinary income rates. So that's all a Roth conversion really is, is converting traditional IRA SAP or simple from what we call pre-tax dollars to after-tax dollars is what a Roth IRA is. And again, a traditional IRA, traditional SEP or simple, first tax deferred, meaning you don't pay tax on any of the annual buildup, but you will eventually, when you go put your hand in that cookie jar and take it out, you'll pay tax at that point. Whereas if you have a Roth IRA and you're over 59 and a half and have had the account for five years, all that income, excuse me, all the money you pull out of the Roth is tax free. So all things being equal, I'd rather have a Roth IRA than a tax deferred traditional separate simple, but it's a function of getting it there. 
So let's take a look here. If I had a hundred thousand dollar traditional IRA, and in 2021 my ordinary income bracket bracket was 22 percent, I would pay, and I converted from traditional to Roth in 2021. I would pay 22 percent on that, or 22,000. Now, uh, and in 2027, if my bracket grew to 24, and that's really why you might want to consider a Roth conversion is if you can convert at today's lower rate and you think you might be in a higher rate later, that's when it really makes the most economic sense. So if my 100 grand grew to 120 and I took money out in 2027, none of that would be taxed because I paid the tax on the conversion in 2021. And if we compare that to a no Roth conversion situation where I had a $100,000 <throat> IRA and it grew to 120,000, and I was at a higher rate in 2027 of 24%, I paid tax at 28,800. So I'd rather pay less tax earlier than more tax later. And even if I inflated that 22,000 uh, at our growth rate, it would still be less than 28,000. So think about Roth conversions when you think your rate today is gonna be lower than a rate in the future. Again, you can convert from a traditional to a Roth at any time, but it, Economically, it can be a different situation depending upon your rate brackets from year to year. Okay, you may have heard of the concept tax loss harvesting, and that's just a uh, glorified word for trying to match some of your gains and some of your losses together. So short-term gains, remember, are taxed at ordinary income rates. So if I can group all my short-term gains and losses and then group my long-term capital gains and losses together. I net those together. And then the net net of those is what I can take on my tax return up to limits. So let's look at Mary and Joe. If they have a $5,000 long-term capital gain and a 3,000 short-term capital gain, and they don't do anything. Well, they're gonna pay ordinary income tax on the 3,000 short-term gain at their ordinary rate. The long-term they pay preferred rates uh, on the 5,000. But if you work with your advisor and you go through your portfolio and say, hey, there's an industrial company mutual fund that's $3,000 loss, let's recognize that and reallocate the portfolio. I get to net that $3,000 capital loss long-term, I've had it longer than a year, against my 5,000 gain to reduce my net long-term capital gain to 2,000. So you can do the same thing with losses as well, uh, for larger ones, but you can only offset capital losses against ordinary income up to 3,000. So for example, if I had short-term capital losses of 12 and capital gains of three, I can't take 9,000 against ordinary income. I can only offset capital losses to the extent of capital gains plus 3,000. So it's very common for us to see people who have capital loss carry forwards of a big amount, but they can only chew up 3,000 a year. So before you start selling a bunch of things in your portfolio, keep in mind those that $3,000 rule and how you're gonna net your capital gains and your capital losses. The other thing to be aware of when we talk about tax loss harvesting here is that there's this thing called the wash sale rule. It only applies to losses. So if you sell things at a gain, you can turn around and rebuy the stock the next day if you had a change of heart. But with losses, they didn't want people to go through, sell your losses, turn around and rebuy Microsoft the next day. So the wash sale rule, you gotta be careful about, if I sold a stock on October 10th, I have to look back 30 days and look forward 30 days. So there's about a 61 day period where I can't buy a substantially identical security to the one I sold for a loss. So just be careful when you're harvesting your losses that you don't turn around and just re uh, up again and buy effectively the same security. Now, let's talk about a concept that I think a lot of people don't know about called qualified charitable distributions or QCDs. And basically what this does is allow you to pay, uh, donate money to charities directly out of your IRA. So in order to do that, you have to be 70 and a half. Uh, when you do this, you. If I turn 70 and a half December 15th, I can't do it right now because I'm not 70 and a half. It's not in the year of, I have to be at least 70 and a half at the time I make this gift. The limit per person is 100,000. 
So if I'm married and I had wanted to do this with my IRA, my spouse could do it with her IRA as well. You can also do this with inherited IRAs. And this can count towards RMDs for the year if you're at least 72. So you're probably saying, okay, I can make a distribution directly out of my IRA to the charity, but what good does that do me? Well, the main thing, and I took a picture of our form 1040 there, and hopefully you can see that with our circle, but on line four of the 1040 is a little line called IRA distributions. So if I make a qualified charitable distribution, it doesn't land at all on my 1040. It goes directly from my IRA to the charity. Again, you don't take it and put it in your pocket. That's the problem. You direct the custodian, your IRA custodian of Baird to move it directly to the charity. It doesn't land on the front page of your 1040. The flip side is you don't get a deduction on Schedule A either. But the reason you wanna keep income off your 1040 as much as possible is because that can affect other benefits you get, including things like higher Medicare premiums. So all things being equal, if I threw 50,000 as an IRA distribution, that could cause me to pay higher Medicare. Whereas if I did the qualified charitable distribution, it doesn't land there. So again, it can be really beneficial to your 1040 if you don't layer on more income, but accomplish what you want to do through this methodology. So real quickly, in scenario one, Mary and Joe, they get 35,000 a year from social security and they've got 14,000 of other income. Now, the social security, we take half of that, that'd be 17,500 added to 14. So that's in scenario one, they're what we call provisional income for taxes is 31 and a half. But at that level, Mary filing joint, zero of that social security is taxed and they would have absolutely no tax liability. But let's assume they didn't know about the qualified charitable distribution concept and they wanted to take 50,000 out of their IRA and give it to charity. Well, they have to take that 50,000, stick it on line four of their 1040. Well, now they're gonna have provisional income of 81,000. And at that level, up to 85% of their social security is eligible for taxation. And they'd end up paying about $4,800 in federal income tax just by doing accomplishing the same thing, but doing it a different way. So the qualified charitable distribution, again, keeps it off your 1040. And if you're 72, it doesn't cause you to, um, you can use your uh, retirement, re excuse me, your um, required minimum distribution to offset that. So very powerful tool for planning. Okay, we talked about the QCD, but let's talk about just in general, charitable contributions. So people will ask, Eric, I want to give $5,000 to the Boys and Girls Club. That's tax deductible, isn't it? And my response is, well, it depends. And it depends on, are you itemizing your tax deductions? And more people used to itemize up until about three or four years ago when a tax law change in 2017 came into effect. And the reason is, is that they increased this thing called the standard deduction. So the standard deduction now for 2021 is 125 for a single person or a little over 25,000 for married filing joint. So when we do tax reviews with people and they say, well, how do I know if I'm itemizing? I say, well, let's go look at your 1040 line 12. And it, it, right there, it says standard deduction or itemized. I get the greater of that gimme, the 125 or 25 or my itemized deductions. So let's take a look as a refresher and remind ourselves what are itemized deductions. Well, are you itemizing? Yes. If the answer is yes, that means your total itemized deductions are exceeding that standard deduction 12 or 25. So the typical itemized deductions that we see on what is known as Schedule A are medical taxes paid, what we call SALT taxes, state and local income taxes, including real estate taxes, interest expense on a mortgage, uh, and charitable contributions. So if I add all those items up, how many of them that I have, and if they're over the standard deduction, then I get the greater of, I get the itemized deduction. And so we need to understand how charitable contributions and this term called adjusted gross income, they're kind of connected, and that's what kind of can limit our charitable contribution, which I'll talk about in a second. But let me tell you, if you don't itemize, if you're that no person, if 
your real estate taxes and interest expense don't exceed the 12,500 or 25,000, you're kind of limited to $300 in cash contributions or 600 for married filing joint for this year. So unfortunately, if you don't itemize, you're really hamstrung on deductible charitable contributions. Doesn't mean you shouldn't give, but you just need to know for tax purposes, they're not nearly as powerful a contribution isn't as if you itemize. That's just the way it is. Okay, another question I get is, uh, Eric, I wanna give some uh, appreciated stock to a charity. And I can kind of give away as much as I want, can I? And I, it's fair market value, so I'm going to give away $100,000 of appreciated Microsoft stock. And I say, well, we need a timeout because contributions like appreciated stock um, have adjusted gross in income limits. So adjusted gross income is our income items minus a few adjustments equals adjusted gross income. So that's an important income item to know on your tax return because there's all kinds of thresholds and limitations that are used off that number. So if you go down to about the fourth item, the long-term capital gain property to a charity is 30%. So if I have adjusted gross income of 100,000 and wanna give away money, I need to know what I'm giving and to where it's going because that's gonna limit the amount of tax deduction I get in a particular year. So let's take a look at that. If I had, like my prior example, wages, interest, and rental income magically was a $100,000 adjusted gross income. And I wanted to give away $40,000 of Microsoft stock that maybe I'd held for a long time. It had a basis of $5,000. So if I sold that, I'd have long-term capital gain of $35,000. But a more efficient way to give that to charity would be to gift it to the charity because I get a donation at the fair market value, $40,000. But if my adjusted gross income, in my example, is 100,000, and I know that that type of donation um, is limited to 30% to the charity I wanna give it to, I'm only limited that year to 30,000 deduction. So if I gave 40,000 and I do my tax return and I find out that my limit for that type of property is 30%, I get to only to deduct 30% that year, uh, I get to carry forward uh, for five years, the remaining 10,000. But again, if you're gonna give away bigger gifts, you need to understand how your AGI, your adjusted gross income, interacts with your giving intentions. A lot of times this doesn't rear its ugly head, but it can with bigger gifts. Okay, now let's talk about something that's very simple that people can do if you just plan a little bit ahead. And that's what we refer to as bunching of itemized deductions. And basically what we're doing is cherry picking those itemized deductions from one year to the next in order to get them to be exceed the standard limitation. And you can use something that's known as a donor advised fund and put money into that because you'll get a deduction for that in the year of contribution. But we're just trying to get above the standard deduction for single or married filers. And we're trying to do that by bunching deductions into a particular year. So let's take a quick look here. Um, the top part here, if I pay annually, like I do every year, I've got property taxes, mortgage interest, charitable contributions. Again, these are items off my schedule A that are my itemized deduction schedule. If I just pay those items every year, I'd have totalized itemized deductions in the blue there of about $24,000. Well, that's great, but it's less than the standard, which is higher, so I get the higher of the itemized or standard. So effectively, I really don't get any benefit if I make a $5,000 charitable contribution every year, do I? But what happens if I said, you know what? I need to get over that $25,000 standard deduction. And the easiest way to do that would be to bunch my charitable contributions. So maybe in 2021, I don't make a charitable contribution, but in 2022, I make two years worth, which would be 10,000. 2023, I skip. 2024, I make 10,000. So over four years, I still make 20,000 of charitable contributions. But what I've done is 2021, I got the standard deduction. 2022, I got the actual, which is higher, 29.5. 2023, standard. 2024, actual. So you see, if we sit through and think what our itemized deductions are, 
And charitable contributions are the easiest ones to control because if we've got mortgage interest, we've got mortgage interest, we've got property taxes, but charitable contributions, we can control very easily. And if you can control those from year to year, chances are you can use them more tax effectively if you can control when you make them. Now, one thing that's near and dear to my heart, because I see a lot of tax returns and I see that people aren't as cash flow efficient as they should be. And I don't like to see people getting big refunds on their tax return because it means they didn't do proper tax planning. Um, I've seen people say, geez, Eric, I get a refund every year and I put that in my savings account. It's like, well, that's fine. But the government doesn't pay us interest for overpayment. So let's go back and look, how do I get money into what I'll call your tax account? And it's basically just credit for you under your social security number. Well, I can apply a prior year refund. And so we put that slide in there with the circle. And a lot of people don't realize that when you get a refund, you don't have to all put it in your pocket. You can apply some of it to your estimated payments for the next year. So that's one way to get money into your account. You can take withholding out of your paycheck, which is virtually everybody does. Um, you can withhold from an IRA or other or investments like annuities. Those withholdings go and give you credit for tax payments. Or the fourth thing, which is very common for retirees and those who are self-employed, or they make their tax payments because they don't have withholding very often. They make quarterly estimated payments, and those payment dates are April, June, September, and January of the next year. So those are the quarterly estimated payment dates, and you can do this uh, better today, but here's just a coupon, a voucher for, for 2021, and I don't know if you can see, but just under payment voucher for there, uh, the due date is January 16th, 2022. So again, that fourth estimated payment date is in the next year. But if you're not paying your taxes in ratably through withholding uh, or through an application of your refund, uh, you probably have to do it through estimated payments. And this comes up and bites a lot of new retirees because they're used to having all their tax payments be credited through their withholding. And now they're in the estimated payment process. So it's important when you go from withholding W-2 guy to retiree, you understand your estimated tax payment process. Again, uh, there's two quick rules I tell people as well. And so all you got to remember to pay into the system, the two rules are you got to pay 90% of the current year liability. Well, that can be kind of hard to figure out because I know we're in November of 2021, but if you're self-employed and your income yo-yos, you might have a real estate deal that closes in December, you might not be able to predict very well what your current year liability is till it's over. So what people do generally is they pay 100% of the prior year. So in 2021, I could look at my 2020 tax return. I know what that tax is. And again, this is page two of your 1040 here with that red circle. People ask, well, Eric, what do you mean tax liability? Where do I find that number? Well, it's not your total income. It's not your adjusted gross income. It's the total tax you pay after some credits and adjustments. So last year, that was line 24. That's your total tax. So as long as you pay in in 2021 through your federal W-2 withholding estimated payments application of refund, as long as you pay in 100% of the prior year, and if your 2020 adjusted gross income, again, there's that AGI number, important to at least Remember today, you learned something new, what AGI, adjusted gross income, is an important benchmark to know. If your AGI for last year was more than 150,000, your benchmark is 110%. So go to your 1040 from last year, pull it out, look at it, see what line 24 tax was. And again, that's this doesn't include what you withheld or what you paid in. That's what your tax was on your income. So again, you've got to pay in 90% of current, 100 or 110% uh, prior. And as long as you do that, that just avoids underpayment penalty and interest. Now you still might have to pay if you have a big increase in tax, taxable income, but at least you'll satisfy the underpayment penalty and interest. That's the important thing. Okay, required minimum distributions. They changed the rules a couple of years ago from 70 and a half to 72. 
So if you're not 72 yet, you don't have to take required minimum distributions. But if you are, you know, the deadline um, is December 31st to get your distribution out. If you turn 72 in this year, you don't have to take it out technically this year. You can take it out next year, but then you'll have two RMDs in 2022. Uh, I see people kind of fall asleep on this. The problem is the penalty is pretty severe. So if your required minimum distribution is 10,000 and you didn't take it out, the penalty on that is 50% of 10. That you'd pay a penalty, not taxed on the penalty, but a penalty of 50%. You'd pay a penalty of $5,000. So be careful. Most people don't forget these, but I've seen people forget to take RMDs because they get busy and the penalty is severe. And so you also have RMDs. If any of you have inherited IRAs, um, you have to take required minimum distributions from inherited IRAs as well. Okay, what other considerations before year end should we be thinking about? Well, the increase, as Kelsey talked about briefly, the increase in ordinary and capital gain rates is not in the latest proposal. Uh, the IRS announced a week ago that the brackets are gonna stay the same. Those percentage rates are not changing, but the inflation amounts are increased a little bit. So the rates didn't go up, but the inflation brackets did a little bit. Um, so just to understand that, but the rates for ordinary and capital gain in the proposal have not gone up. The state plan, excuse me, state tax exemption is not in the proposal, but it doesn't mean you shouldn't consider estate planning. Uh, I know here in the state of Washington, we have a fairly low uh, hurdle, 2.2 million for estate tax. And so people focus on the 11.7 federal, next year it's scheduled to go to a little over 12 million, but say, ah, people say, you know, Eric, I don't have a federal estate tax issue. I don't need to do estate planning. It's like, well, but you've got an estate over 2.1 for Washington. So don't forget the state side and, you know, rules change all the time. And so estate planning still is important, even though the rates for this latest tax change don't look like they're going to change. Um, again, don't let that tax tail wag the dog. Understand your portfolio positioning and long-term investment strategy, work with your advisor. I see people who just they hate paying taxes. I get it. I don't like paying taxes either, but I've also watched people watch their portfolio go down. And then I talk to them and say, well, at least now you get to pay less taxes because your gains are less. So make good investment decisions, reallocate your portfolio, talk to your financial advisor, make good long-term decisions, then understand the tax implications, but don't make decisions, investment decisions with tax decisions first and foremost. Again, a lot of these decisions we're talking about can't be reversed. So if you sell a security today because you think you're being clever and you're gonna net some gains and losses, that hopefully will work out, but you can't hit the rewind button on that. And so there's a lot of things you can't undo. So make sure like for contributions, you understand where you are on adjusted gross income, what type of charitable contribution you're making, what the AGI limitation is, because once you make it, you can't reverse it. So with that being said, that's my, uh, that's my part of the presentation. And uh, thank you very much for uh, tuning in today. Great, thank you, Kelsey and Eric. We very much value your expertise here. Before you begin with the first question, I'll just take a moment to remind everyone that if you would like to ask a question, you can do so via the Q&A icon on the bottom right-hand side of your screen. Just please be sure to address your questions to all panelists. Um, I saw quite, quite a few popping through here. I know Tim and Kelsey, you have been answering them. Are there any, Eric or Kelsey, that you want to highlight? Yeah, I can touch on um, one question was the $10 million thresholds for the uh, increased required minimum distributions come with 2029. Um, is that subject to inflation? And it is un our understanding that those amounts are subject to inflation. Um, so the 10 million would apply for the first year and then be adjusted um, for cost of living adjustments each year. Let's see. Um, We've also been asked, does the 5% AGI surcharge on trust apply if the trust passes through income to beneficiaries via the K-1? Um, and the answer is, if the income is ultimately passed through to a beneficiary on the K-1, 
it becomes income to that beneficiary and it's recorded on their personal tax return. So the 5% would only apply if the income is kept in the trust and therefore taxed at the trust level. Um, here we've got some new ones. Do you, do you need to take the RMD at age 72 if you are still employed? Uh, there is a still working exception. Um, it is based, it's a per plan provision. So um, even though they're, they're um, oh wait, I'm thinking of the taking, oh no, the still working exception, yeah. So um, as long as you take, or as long as you're still working and your plan allows for it, you can defer the RMD. Is that right, Eric? Am I saying that correctly? I'm sorry, Kelsey, one more time. Um, if it, the RMD at age 72, you can defer that if you're still employed correctly. It, it only applies to your employer plan and, and it, it's only if your employer plan allows it, um, you'd still have to take an RMD from an IRA, but you can defer it if you are still working, correct? Yes. If, yes. Uh, if you're still working your employer plan, I believe if you uh, own, uh, there's a 5% ownership threshold, but if you're an employee and don't own 5% or more of the company, uh, you can defer taking your RMDs out of your out of your employer retirement plan. Yes. All right. Let's see. Um, uh, there's one question uh, someone asked, can you be specific, more specific on which taxes qualify as part of what's known as SALT? And SALT is just the acronym for state and local taxes. And so a couple of years ago uh, on the Schedule A, the way it used to be, is that you, there was an unlimited state and local tax exemption. So if you lived in a state which, with income tax, which most people do, the state income tax is a deduction, uh, real estate taxes are deducted, our uh, deduction. Those are the two most common are state income tax and state or local real estate taxes. Uh, sales tax, I believe, is uh, still part of that. So those three taxes were part of state and local taxes. Well, they put a $10,000 cap on that. So if your state income tax was 13 and your real estate tax was 10, uh, you're already at 23. Well, you're capped at 10 based on that wonderful rule they put in a couple of years ago. Well, the latest proposal, uh, and Kelsey, what is it? 72,000 or 80,000 now they've come up with? Um, 80,000, so they, yep. They, yep, they're gonna increase that $10,000 ceiling substantially. So between your state income tax, your local real estate tax and sales tax, as long as you're under the that limit of what, 80,000? Um, you should be able to deduct all that on Schedule A. And that really, a $10,000 cap really hurt a lot of people, especially those in high income uh, state states. Uh, we had a question. Can you convert the rollover IRA to a Roth IRA? I had a 403B plan that I rolled over into a, a rollover IRA after leaving the university job. Um, yes, you can. So um, it sounds like, yeah, you have a rollover IRA, you rolled the funds into a traditional IRA, those funds can be converted to a Roth account. Um, the, the proposal would limit any, if you had any basis in that rollover IRA, um, the, pro the proposal would uh, not allow you to convert the basis dollars, um, so the, the after-tax dollars. But if, if those dollars are pre-tax, yes, you could convert those to a Roth. Uh, a, sorry, go ahead. Okay, I'm sorry. There's a question uh, Ed wrote in. Do transactions by Baird generate short long-term capital gains that we need to deal with or only on distribution? So Ed, if you're, you, you may have mutual fund stocks that generate dividends, uh, mutual fund capital gains. So when you say distribution, I'm assuming you mean taking money actually out of the Baird account, distributing it to you. But yes, you could have short-term and long-term capital gains within your portfolio that you'll get a 1099 for, um, which will you'll have to put in your 1040. So just because you don't take it out of the account and stick it on your in your pocket, um, it's still going to be taxable income for you. So hopefully that answered that uh, part of your question. If not, let us know. 
Um, I see if in a small, if I'm in a small tax bracket, is it worth contributing, contributing to a Roth 401k over a regular 401k? Um, it really depends on the, on the client specific tax situation. I'd say generally uh, you do want to contribute to a Roth account when you're in a lower tax bracket, because you're not getting quite um, as much benefit as if you were in a higher tax bracket. And then, you know, as your income starts to increase, as you start getting in higher tax brackets, the regular 401k might be a little bit more appealing, but it's very specific to your, um, your uh, own situation. There was a question, um, uh, Eric, can you suggest strategies for mutual fund capital gain distributions? Um, mutual funds uh, are known for making capital gain distributions generally in November. A lot of them do. Um, so one of the things to understand about your mutual fund is historically what kind of capital gain distributions have they made and when. Um, so as far as strategies with that, um, usually they'll announce or you can tell from prior years what they've done or what, what percent uh, been distributed in capital gains. So my suggestion there would be just try to do some planning with your advisor and know historically based on the size of your mutual fund holding, what you might be able to expect in capital gain distribution. So it's not a complete surprise. Uh, that would be my suggestion there. So again, knowing in November, if you got a capital gain distribution of X, then you can look at your portfolio and you can still take some action before the end of the year and potentially sell some underperforming uh, securities that would generate capital losses. And again, you could net those together. Um, all right, so I see, can an RMD be offset or used as a Roth conversion? Um, no, so um, you have to, any year that you are of RMD age, so if you're at least 72, you'll have to take your RMD before any Roth conversion. Um, and you can't use RMD dollars to roll into a Roth IRA. You'd have to take your RMD first, and then if there's a balance remaining in the account, then you could do a Roth conversion on that remaining balance. Yeah, there was a clarification. Um, Mark asked about RMDs from inherited IRAs. So they changed the rule in 2020, I believe. So you can, um, instead of RMDs annually, the owner uh, beneficiaries have no required, let me clarify that. You can go all, you have a 10 year rule. And so you could go all the way and not take any RMDs, but go all the way to the end of your 10, but then you basically have to empty the account. So you can take RMDs uh, throughout the period or they put in this 10 year rule where you have to take basically empty the account by your 10. We do have about a minute left, so maybe time for one more question. So there was a question, Jim has a question, married filing joint, a spouse one contributes to a 401k spouse. Oops, sorry, just slipped on me. Uh, where to go here? Sorry about that. It just, uh, here we go. Let me see if I can hold this. Spouse one contributes to 401k, spouse two also works, but does not contribute. And spouse number two contribute to a traditional IRA for 2021 and what limit? So it looks like both spouses are eligible to contribute in employer plans. So there's lower limits on what can be contributed to an IRA, um, but that's a good question. So if, if one didn't, one wasn't eligible, one did, one could contribute at a higher income level, but since you both are eligible, that's a lower income limit to contribute to a traditional IRA. Great, thanks, Eric. And thank you, Kelsey. We are at time here, so I'm just gonna quickly close out, but thank you everyone for joining today. I hope that you found this information impactful and helpful and a good use of your time. For those of you who'd like to review today's presentation or share it with a friend, family member, or colleague, 
The session has been recorded and will be made available approximately a week through your Baird Financial Advisor or Baird Contact. If we were not able to address your questions or you'd like additional information, please also reach out to your Baird Contact and they'll get you connected with the appropriate resource and get your question answered. Next month, there will be no Baird Wealth Strategies webinar, so we wish you a happy holiday and hope that you join us again in January. Thank you all and enjoy the rest of your afternoon.